Hello everybody, my name is Sebastian Krita and I'll be talking about the paper Incremental Construction of Model Implication Graphs for Evolving Feature Models. This is joint work between many different co-authors. I myself am from the Harz University of Applied Sciences, but we also have people from the TU Braunschweig, University of Ulm, and the ITU Copenhagen. So let me first introduce you to Model Implication Graphs and what are they for. So imagine you have a configuration and you're manually selecting features. Then, of course, as you have a feature model, and uh, this has different constraints, you may end up with conflicts in your um, configuration. In order to avoid this, you can, for instance, use decision propagation, which means you have an interactive um, um, configuration process where you select one um, feature, and then decision propagation will determine the state of all the other features based on your decision. So in this particular case, you can select and deselect many other features just based on this one decision. And this, of course, then um, leads to a valid configuration in the end that will have no conflicts at all. So what's the problem with decision propagation? The problem, of course, is that you have large-scale feature models. Uh, this, for example, is uh, from the automotive domain with over 18,000 features, over 1,000 constraints. And if you would do it naively, you would need for just one decision propagation over 39,000 subqueries. And of course, subqueries are NP-complete and don't really scale well in this um, in this domain. So, and uh, what can we do about this? So we came up uh, in a previous paper with the uh, new data structure of a model implication graph, which looks like this. And what you can see here is uh, it consists of different nodes that represent the selection states of all the features. So for example, uh, we have the uh, Windows feature uh, when we select it and when we deselect it. And now, from these nodes, we have different edges. So we have strong edges, uh, which just act like regular implications that you know from an implication graph. So which means if you select the feature windows, you also have to select the feature Debian, and you have to select the feature NTFS and so on. So everything that's reachable via a path that only consists of strong edges um, must be selected when you select uh, one of these features in the graph. But of course, this doesn't. Um, uh, this isn't enough for uh, describing the feature model, so we have to add a different uh, type of edges, which we call weak edges. And these edges don't uh, represent a direct implication, but just mean that there's a relationship between the selection of one feature to the selection of another feature. And under some circumstances, if, for example, you are deselecting the feature Debian, then you also have to select the feature windows. So how can we determine this? Uh, for this, um, for each decision propagation, we traverse the graph. And we start by looking at the feature that we selected. So in our example, we selected Windows. So and from this feature, we can now determine whether uh, we can reach certain nodes or not. So of course, we have the set of all nodes. Then we have the set of nodes that are connected to this feature so that we can reach via any path. And we have the features that we can reach via paths that are only consist of strong nodes, which we call strongly connected. So, and as it turns out, um, we um, can use logical deduction, as I just uh, showed you, uh, for all the ones that are strongly connected. So we don't have to use a Satsau at all. And of course, if they are not connected at all, we also have to use uh, no Satsau because they don't have any relationship. And only for the remaining ones, the ones that I can reach via a path that contains at least one weak edge, uh, I have to use a Satsau in, um, in the decision propagation, which tremendously speeds up the process. So what's the problem with this um, new data structure? Of course, the problem is that we uh, have to build it first to use it. So and now I'm introducing you to the build process of a model implication graph. And of course, you have to build a model implication graph for one particular feature model. So and the problem with that is that in order to build it, you have to again employ subqueries, which, as I told you already, don't scale well for large feature models, and especially for feature models with complex constraints. So, and now it gets even worse. Uh, once you build a feature model, uh, once you build a MIG for a feature model, you may want to change your feature model yeah? um, because you're um, developing your product line. And now, of course, if you change your feature model, you have to rebuild your uh, model implication graph, which means if you make frequent changes to your feature model, you have to build your MIG again and again and uh, employ this uh, maybe computation expensive build process over and over again. And so the idea. Uh, which we're talking about in this paper is, of course, coming up with an incremental build process, which only updates a uh, MIG that you previously built on an older version. 
So how can we do this? So to understand an incremental build process, we first have to look at the original build process. And here I show you the different phases of the original build process, which have different operations. So the first phase is analyzing the feature model for any anomalies that we have to uh, then consider in building the graph structure. So first of all, we're looking whether the feature model is void, because a void feature model don't need a graph at all, because it has no solutions. So then we're looking at core and dead features, because core and dead features don't need to be represented in graph, because they only have one selection state. Similarly, um, this goes for redundant constraints. Here we differentiate between internally redundant, which means they come down to either tautology or con um, contradiction, which means they are simply true or false, and externally redundant constraints, which means uh, when you remove uh, such a constraint from the feature model, uh, it doesn't change anything about the configuration space. Once we have uh, results for all of these analysis, we can go ahead with the second phase, which is deriving the graph structure. So here we're looking at all the non-core and non-dead features and derive the nodes. Uh, and then we're looking at all the constraints that are not redundant and deriving the strong edges and the weak edges. So finally, we optimize the graph, which means we are building the strong hull, which means we add all the transitive strong edges to the graph in order to speed up the traversing process later on when we use the graph. And what we also do is we detect implicit strong edges, which might be um, due to some um, redundant constraints. So for example, there might be a weak edge. And uh, as it turns out, we can um, we can transform this weak edge into a strong edge um, because of the internal, um, internal constraints of the feature model. So and this then again um, speeds up the um, traversing later on because when we have more strong edges, we can uh, make more logical deductions and have to use uh, less frequently the SAT solver. So and as it turns out, of all these operations, uh, only one, uh, only some of them are really expensive, and um, these are mainly the ones that are using the SAT solver. So this is core and dead features, externally redundant constraints and detecting implicit strong edges. So, and now the idea for the incremental build process is to focus on these three operations and modify them so um, that we reusing information and speed up the process. So how can we do this? So as I said, we are want to use um, previous operations and uh, previously uh, informations. And we have these informations from, of course, the feature model change and the previously built MIP. And with this information, then we want, want to try to reduce the subqueries that each of these time-consuming operations needs. And we are doing this by either um, applying uh, heuristics or skipping analysis entirely. And as you might have guessed, uh, both of these options then result in a MIG that is not complete, which means it's missing some strong edges or it might be miss, uh, might be include more weak edges than necessary. And we also um, talked about this in our um, previous paper where we introduced mix, uh, where we already uh, introduced the notion of incomplete mix. And this boils down to that these incomplete mix will have a faster build time because you need um, less of these computationally expensive operations, but they will have a reduced effectiveness uh, when you're using them in decision propagation. But of course, they are still correct. So all the results that you get from uh, decision propagation will still be correct and there will be no conflict in your um, configuration. So you can still use incomplete mix. They might only be uh, less effective. So what kind of informations we can reuse to speed up the operations? So first of all, we can um, use the information from the feature model change. And here we can differentiate between um, clauses that we added to the feature model compared to the uh, older version and clauses that we removed from the feature model. And of course, there are also clauses that we modified. And um, this would be then a combination of these two. So a modified clause would be just one that we removed and then added uh, slightly differently. And of course, from these clauses, we can also uh, infer a set of features that are uh, in this um, added or removed clauses, which means that these features are more likely to be um, um, in any anomalies than other features because they're directly uh, mentioned in these uh, clauses that are added or removed. It might be that other features are also um, also influenced by uh, new anomalies uh, when we change the feature model, but these, of course, are more likely. And we can, of course, exploit this fact in uh, using a heuristic. Then we have the previously built MIG. And 
as we did all the analysis part in the um, build, original building process, uh, we can, of course, reuse the analysis results. And we have a list of core features, we have a list of redundant clauses, and we have a list of implicit strong edges that we can then reuse. And now, what's the idea um, of modifying the operations? So, of course, when we look at the results from the previous MIG, we want to reuse as many as possible. So, for instance, if we only adding constraints to our um, formula, so our feature model changed only by adding constraints, we can never remove any anomalies that were previously there, because by adding clauses or constraints, you only can introduce new anomalies, but never remove old ones. So in this case, we can keep all the previous results without verifying it. We can just uh, reuse them in our new MIG. And similarly, for only removing constraints, we can only remove anomalies, but never introduce new ones. So we only have to verify our old results and uh, don't need to look for new ones uh, that we might have introduced. So the only problem is what happens if we do both, if we add, cons uh, add constraints and also remove constraints. Then we have to look at the operations um, in a bit more detail. So for finding core dead features, we uh, sadly can't do anything because uh, if we would use a heuristic here or uh, skipping this operation, then we would uh, indeed end up with an incorrect um, graph, which would then contain core dead features uh, as nodes, and um, this would lead to incorrect results. So we can't change anything here. But um, this operation is by far the most uh, fast one compared to the other two of uh, detecting implicit strong edges and finding externally redundant constraints. So, and for these two, it turns out that we can use heuristics and uh, maybe skip the analysis. So, and the heuristic that we um, chose was that we are looking at the features that were um, contained in the edit or removed um, constraints that we add or remove. And then we only look at um, edges or constraints that contain these features. So, and of course, this might be ending up with we are not considering some constraints or some edges that are might be relevant, but we skip lots of the uh, expensive operations or steps in our operation and uh, we speed up the um, entire process. But of course, we can also not opt for using heuristic, but skip the analysis uh, entirely, which means, of course, we have to verify the old results from our previous MIG if we want to reuse this, uh, but we don't have to look for any new anomalies. Yeah? And we just uh, skipping this analysis entirely. We um, evaluated both of these um, different options in our evaluation so um, that we can see the different uh, that it makes. So talking about the evaluation, um, we have different research questions. Um, the first is, of course, does an incrementally build process uh, even improve the performance compared to an original build process? And of course, if it does, our second question is, uh, if we use completeness uh, for an incrementally built process, does it impact its effectiveness? And if yes, by how much? And last but not least, um, based on these two questions, can we give a uh, sort of hint to developers when it's useful to use an incremental build process and when it might not be? So these are the questions we want to um, uh, find out in our evaluation. And for this, um, we, of course, have to look at um, our build process and at the usage of the of the uh, MIG that results from the build process. So uh, we are comparing, of course, the original with the incremental build process and the time uh, that they take. And we take the results of both these uh, build processes and then compare uh, a decision propagation uh, with these two graphs that uh, are resulting. So, and also look at the time difference here. So for this, we are using different uh, systems uh, which all have uh, larger version history because Without a version history, we can't uh, do anything incrementally. And here we have um, the systems BusyBox, financial services, automotive, and Linux with different amounts of features, different amount of versions. Uh, some of them uh, for BusyBox, for example, are based on commits, which change about daily. And uh, all of the others are mainly based uh, on monthly snapshots, uh, which means there are um, more uh, larger changes between these feature models. So um, I grayed out Linux here because uh, Linux didn't uh, scale well for the original build process uh, in some circumstances. And so we don't include it in all our um, results that I'm about to show. So when we're talking about the evolution history of these uh, feature models, we have to think about, okay, how we, can we 
um, use them to uh, in our incremental build process. So, and here um, there are of course different scenarios, and in our evaluation we include three of them. So the first one would be just to consider consecutive versions. So uh, we built an original milk uh, an original MIG for the first version, and then we build an incremental MIG for the second version, and then we do the same for the second and the third version, for the fourth and the fifth version, and so on, until we reach the end of the evaluation. But of course, we don't have to do this. What we can also do is we build an original MIG for the first version, then we build an uh, incremental MIG for the second version, and use this incremental MIG then for building uh, another incremental MIG for the third version, and so on until we reach um, the end of our revision history. And what we can, of course, also do is uh, skip in uh, versions entirely. So here in this last scenario, we build an original MIG for the first version, and then we build an incremental MIG for the second version, and then for the third version and for the nth version, uh, and all of them using the original build process from the first version, which means the feature model change between these versions grows larger and larger. So now, of course, we want to see how these um, compare um, against each other. But of course, um, I told you we have different options for our um, incremental build process also. And here you can see all of the five parameter settings that we're using in our implementation and in our evaluation. So of course, also in the original build process, we can skip um, finding redundancies and strong edges. And if we do this, we can't um, use the um, um, results in our incremental build process, of course. So we also have to skip it there. Um, but if we use it, we have the option between um, skipping the operation or using heuristic. And um, this is what we do in our different parameter settings here. So to show you the results, here we have the first parameter setting, which means we have no redundancy detection and no implicit strong edges detection at all. And uh, what you can see here is uh, for the three scenarios that we have, the consecutive, accumulative, and sequential scenario, um, the ratio of the build time from the original to the incremental build process. So you can see a dotted line in all these plots, which means there the um, incremental build process and the original build process um, have the same time. And if it's below this, the original build process is faster. And if it's above the line, then the incremental build process is faster. And you see, if we skipping the uh, expensive operation entirely, then there is no benefit in um, using uh, the incremental build process at all. So, but also the absolute times here are really, really low. So um, it gets more interesting if we actually um, use um, some of these um, uh, some of these operations. So for example, if we um, look for redundancies, you can see that the incremental build process is almost every time faster. And um, you can also see that there is no really difference between all these um, different evaluation scenarios for the evolution history. So at least when we are only looking for redundancies. This, change if, uh, this changes if we um, using heuristic instead of skipping um, uh, the redundancy. So here you can see that uh, for the sequential, um, the sequential scenario, uh, the, um, the, the, the um, amount of feature model change impacts the benefits that we have from using the incremental build process. The more changes we have in the, um, in the feature model, the less, um, the less beneficial is the incremental build process. So, and we can see the same behavior um, here when we use heuristics for redundancy and strong detection. Um, still, the incremental build process is faster, but if the feature model change uh, grows too large, it's not as fast as uh, for smaller feature model changes. And um, yeah, so for skipping the operations entirely, we again can see no difference between the different scenarios, um, but we can see that the build process is much faster um, for, um, um, yeah, for, for building. So, how about the um, usage time? So here you can see the relative usage time for decision propagation for all the different models. And uh, again, this is the ratio for the incremental to the, uh, the original to the incremental build process, which means if it's above the dotted line, then the original was faster in decision propagation. And if it's above the dotted line, then the incremental uh, build make is faster in decision propagation. And here you can see almost no difference. So between the um, uh, different versions. And also the 
absolute times are really negligible here. So, and especially for the larger uh, models like automotive and Linux, you can see there's almost no difference in using a complete MIG uh, compared to an incomplete MIG that results from the incremental build process. So to conclude everything from our results, you can see that we are able to effic efficiently create a new MIG after a feature model change occurs. And we're able to do this by either reducing the uh, subtrapies by a heuristic or skipping expensive operations entirely. And of course, uh, there we are trading off some of the uh, completeness of our graph, which affects the uh, effectiveness in decision propagation. But as you also see, it's not affected by much. So we can really recommend using an incrementally built MIG or an incomplete MIG in decision propagation. So thank you all for your attention and goodbye.